Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. I'm sorry that I was not with you on Ash Wednesday when we had the beginning of Lent, that day when the ashes are imposed on our foreheads. And we hear those words of our own mortality, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And it's a a sobering day, isn't it, Ash Wednesday? It's a day to remember that, that we all are on earth, sometimes some of us for a very brief period of time, others for somewhere in the middle, some very long lengths of time. I saw on the news last night where I don't know how this was uh, found, but a woman in Japan had, who's now considered the oldest person in the world, she's 116 years of age. And, uh, you know, people always ask you what she credits, you know, your longevity to. And among other things, she said she likes to do mathematic problems, arithmetic. So maybe that's not a bad way to keep our minds sharp. But we begin in Lent, on, on the first Sunday in Lent, always with this same text, this account of the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. And it's a little bit of a confusing text, isn't it? Because uh, Jesus must have told his followers about this, and they must have told Luke about the encounters and kind of uh, it would be interesting to hear how that was described because Luke just kind of jumps right into it and tells us what each one of them is saying Jesus and the devil but it would be interesting to hear Jesus as he told his disciples about what it was that he experienced it was right after his baptism which for Jesus was his ordination meaning his call into public ministry Up until that time, this 29, 30-year-old Jesus had been growing in his Jewish faith and understanding certainly from his mothers and other people in the synagogue of which he was a part and and friends and family that, that all this had happened when he was born. And when he was even 12 years old, there was that whole story in the temple And Jesus now, with his cousin John baptizing him, had come to experience in a new way for himself. God saying to him, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. That at his baptism, the dove descended upon him and the spirit alighted with him. And Jesus was changed. And the first thing that happened was that Jesus said, I need to go off by myself for a while. I need to put into perspective what it is that has happened to me and what it is that God would have me be and do in what would be the three years to come in his earthly ministry. And the little sentences that I read, the conversation between Jesus and the devil, which is basically both of them kind of proof texting uh, scripture, where the devil is trying to manipulate and use scripture to get Jesus to do things, and Jesus is saying, that's not how you use scripture, devil, but rather scripture is used to open ourselves to God's leading, not to try to get God to do whatever our bidding might be. But those little sentences didn't take much time to say. And if you put that in context, (coughs) it means that in the 40 days of the wandering wandering in the desert, that there was a lot of time when Jesus was just alone and had time to think and to wonder and perhaps to be lonely and to perhaps be comforted by God. In Matthew's account of his temptation stories, it says that after the devil left him, that the angels came and ministered to him. And I've always liked that account, that the angels were there with Jesus too. But make no doubt about it, the devil was there, as the devil is a very real and powerful person or force or entity or however we want to describe uh, that evil part that comes in the word devil or Satan. You might remember that in the Old Testament, the the name was given to the devil of Beelzebub, which literally means Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Garbage Dump, where all the the garbage was burned and the odors came out, and that the devil was Lord of that messy, yucky place. It's it's something when we talk about the devil and darkness, 
it can be something we do playfully. I remember years ago, the old comedian Flip Wilson uh, used to be familiar with the line, you know, the devil made me do it. And so we, sometimes we might say that in a flippant way that if we, if we eat a donut when we probably should have had a multi-grain bar or something, well, the devil made me do it. And uh, uh, that's fine. But I think it's much more helpful for me to think of the devil not as kind of he came to be personified mostly in the Middle Ages with the pitchfork and the horns and the tail and red and all this kind of thing, but rather to think of the devil as the places where we see uh, just hatred and evil at, at its worst. And uh, we, can, we can think in, in global ways of things in history or even in the present, but that, that the presence of the devil is wherever uh, hatred and lying and abuse and, and coarseness and self-centeredness, all those types of qualities, that's, that's where the devil, that's where darkness, evil, is alive and at work. And the devil is around us, however we, again, kind of personify that entity. And my guess is that as we've walked the Christian life together, if we had the opportunity to talk, we could talk about temptations that we feel the devil may sometimes put into our place, into our lives, and temptations that probably have changed with us over the course of our lives. That I don't know about you, but the same things that might have tempted me when I was 18 or 21 or 25 aren't the same things that tempt me at, at 60, 61 different types of temptations. And also, I think growing as a Christian means we understand the nature of temptations differently, that it's not just saying or doing something bad, but rather the temptation can be something where we really don't trust God at the end of the day, where we're, where we're tempted just to feel like, you know, maybe the devil and all his empty promises are right, uh, that God doesn't really love me or care for me, that grace isn't really true, uh, that Jesus isn't really present in this simple meal. The devil's always trying to get simple ways to get us to get into our minds, if you will, get into our heads and play with our thinking of the faith that God gives us. Jesus was really tempted, if you will, in three ways. The first way in the turning the stones into bread was a temptation to be relevant, to be practical. Jesus, if you're hungry, says the devil, make a sandwich, turn the loaf into bread. Do what you need to do. You're the son of God. You can do anything you want. God doesn't care. And the second temptation Jesus has from the devil is that to be spectacular. You're the son of God. You're the only begotten son of God. You can do miracles. Do you know what? In the years to come, you're going to change fish, uh, loaves and fishes into food to feed 5,000. You're going to walk on water. You're going to raise the dead to life. Jesus, you can do whatever you want. You're the miracle man. And the Jesus really wanted to get that, uh, the devil wanted to get that into Jesus' head. And that kind of connects to the third one, where the Jesus says, where the devil says to Jesus, you have all this uh, you can have all this power, but I'll tell you what, you can have even more if you follow me. Just follow my ways. It's a better way. It's the same types of temptations, temptations of relevance and spectacularness and power that, uh, that might be tempted, say, with a teenager to, to try uh, something illegal for the first time to steal something from a store or to, or to take a drug or whatever it might be, you'll feel so much better. Everybody's doing it. Nobody's going to know. It's the voice of the devil that all of us in different ways come to know. And I think that the lesson that we have for us this Sunday is to remember a couple of things. One is that the devil is always around us. In the book of 1 Peter, there's a wonderful verse that says, Your adversary, the, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. And so we resist the devil as much as we possibly can. And part of that is planning ahead and, and trying not to put ourselves into places where there may be temptations that are beyond our control. That's just smart thinking. 
I think, a second teaching of this text for us today (coughs) is to know that the devil will be manipulative and use whatever means are necessary to get to us. And to, to, to never be so secure and trusting that, you know, I've got it all together in my faith and my trust and belief that I almost don't need God anymore. I know how it works. That when we get that arrogant, if you will, that we don't need others and that we don't need God, God has a real good way of kind of bringing us down a few notches and remembering that we're human. Right before the baptism story in Luke's gospel, he has the genealogy of Jesus, the the family history of Jesus going back. And in Luke's gospel, he traces it through Mary, not through through, uh, Joseph. And in that way, um, in that way, it ends with saying that Jesus was born the son of Adam. And I think Luke was intentional in writing that because Adam was the first man in the story. And in Adam means, means earth or dirt, the stuff that we're made of, dust to dust. And the first man was offered similar temptations of relevance and spectacularness and power that Jesus was. If you, if you take the fruit... God knows. God knows if you eat it, you're going to be just like God, and God's got nothing on you. Just take it. Take it. What's the matter with you? And Adam did, like we do. Jesus did not. Jesus said no to the devil. He said no to the lies. He said no because he was the Son of God, and that we can't expect us to be Christ. He is the Messiah. We are the servants, the followers of the Messiah. But he can be our model and our example to try to resist temptations as much as we can in the ways that we come to us. And I'll tie this together by sharing with you what I think is the biggest temptation of all. That is the temptation to think that we don't matter to God. That either we haven't done enough that's good or we've done too much that's wrong or that God really loves more important people or people that know the Bible better or that people that go to church more, whatever it might be. The temptation is always to think that somehow we're not loved by God as much as we have been. And, and we are. And maybe it's because even the best of our human reveling relationships are human. Uh, but that God's love for us and God's love for our sisters and brothers is divine, and that God loves us beyond measure and beyond understanding. And the greatest temptation of the devil is to try to get us to doubt that and to not believe it and to think that it depends on something else, usually something that we have to do. But the good news, the word of grace that leads us to the cross this Lenten season is that Jesus is found in the power and in the relevance and in the spectacularness of the cross, which is a symbol of weakness and vulnerability and pain. And it's that paradox, that that paradox that we wrestle with as being followers of Jesus. But I don't know about you, as I live out this Christian life and continue to come to another Lent and think about these things, I find that the promises of Jesus are always true. And the assurances of God that he loves me and he loves you. And God, and God wants us to love what God loves. And to know that the devil is powerful and strong. But that we can resist him. And that Jesus has overcome and is always overcoming darkness, evil, the devil. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in faith unto everlasting life. Amen.